right. Well, thank you all for uh, for coming along. Um, let me start by asking a question. What do you think of the 2020s so far? I began this decade with a full head of black hair, and look at me now. I mean, we've had a, a once-in-a-century pandemic, and then in response to that, we've had governments and central banks printing biblical amounts of money, closing down economies, closing down supply chains, and then when they all open up again, they've been surprised to find that we've got 40-year high inflation. Who'd ever have guessed? And then to respond to that, they've raised interest rates further and faster than ever before. We've now got banks failing left, right and centre. We've got uh, uh, interest rates still going up. Inflation still going up, 10.4%, the most recent print, I think, in the UK. Uh, we've got a, a, a cost of living crisis. We've got an energy crisis. Oh, and uh, an escalating war in Ukraine. What possibly go wrong? In this environment, we are supposed to make sensible investment decisions. Now, I think one of the problems is, I think we're living through what could become a historic inflection point. But the challenge with historic inflection points is they're much easier to see in the rearview mirror than they are when you're living through them. So, for example, we now know that back in 1971, when Richard Nixon took the, the dollar effectively off the gold standard, you used to be able to swap $35 for an ounce of gold. That was the moment when all central banks and all governments lost the need for any financial discipline. From that point on, you could just print all the currency you need to fulfill your promises to the electorate. And we'll see the impact of that in a few minutes' time. But I also think Joe Biden's decision to weaponize the dollar and the swift payment system in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine will prove to be a similar inflection point. Already, we're seeing Saudi Arabia accepting payment for its oil in currencies other than the dollar, so the petrodollar era is over. We're seeing a whole new kind of BRICS formation of countries who are talking about their own currency, probably some combination of the Chinese Yuan backed by gold and other rare earth minerals or possibly oil. So there's a huge shift of power, politics and economy eastwards. And I think it's happening faster than most of our leaders and many of our population realize. And that's part of the backdrop for us as investors to try and anticipate how that's all going to play out and be on the right side of this historic inflection point. We've also got to deal with the, the politicization of the financial markets. We now have central banks setting the price of money and the interest rates, but they're also responsible for employment. They're increasingly being given roles like climate change. And also, they're buying so many financial instruments as part of their political agenda. So how can you and I know the fair price of, say, a US Treasury bond when you've got a buyer of last resort who will pay any price for it deliberately to try and keep the yields down. In the Bank of Japan's case, they've run out of government bonds to buy, so they're now buying stocks and shares. So how can we know the fair price of Sony or Toyota when you've got a buyer prepared to pay any price for a political agenda? It makes our investment decisions so much tougher because it's not a free market, it's a manipulated market, and it's only getting worse. And we need to talk about inflation. Um, if you're under 60, you probably didn't live through the 1970s and really know what inflation is like. Um, sadly, I'm no longer under 60, so I was there and I did see what it was like. And I think a lot of people are way too apathetic about the extent to which inflation destroys wealth. We've got members in, in Beaufort who've got six, seven figures sitting in high street bank accounts. And I plead with them to do something about it because you know, they're going to lose 100, 150,000 of purchasing power by the end of this year. You know, that's how inflation destroys wealth. I talked about 1971. If you'd had a million pounds in the bank, this was a year that we went decimal, for those of you who remember. Um, if you'd had a million in the bank then and you'd done nothing with it, and just left it there, it would now be worth the grand total of £50,526. You'd have lost 95% of your wealth. 
And that now today, with inflation at 10% officially, and that's the latest uh, formula for calculating inflation, which changes every time it gets too high, there'll be a new one coming along soon, don't worry. If we use the 1980s definition of inflation, we're already at 15% today, and it's only getting worse. I, I can't believe when I hear Jeremy Hunt or Andrew Bailey say that having gone up to 10%, inflation will now obediently come neatly all the way back down to their 2% target. What are they smoking? Deutsche Bank just released a new study. They have looked at 318 occasions between 1920 and today when inflation reached 8%. On average, it stayed at 8% for two years. It then came down to 6% for a further five years. So if we took that as the average, we should expect at least 6% inflation for the rest of this decade. I don't see any chance of it getting back to 2% anytime soon. Of course, the 319th occurrence of this could be the exception that proves the rule. How much of your family's wealth would you like to bet on those odds? So inflation is something you've really got to be careful about eating away at your wealth. Remember I said 1971 was a key year? That's a thin line, but hopefully you can see in terms of spending and government debt, how it goes hyperbolic shortly after 1971, when all discipline is removed. And what that means is, if you look at the balance sheet of UK PLC, we now have 2.6 trillion of debt. Have you noticed how that word has just crept into the lexicon in the last few years? When I grew up, nobody talked about trillions. I'm still, I, I struggle to get my head around a billion. A trillion? What's coming next, a quadrillion or something? It's a ridiculous amount of money that will never be repaid. It's already over 100% of Britain's GDP. There's no way back from these kind of numbers. We'd all have to write a check to Jeremy Hunt for 91,000 pounds just to get back to even. What that also means, of course, <clears throat> is that this debt has to have an interest paid on it. It's like a giant interest-only mortgage that the country's running on. And this year, we will pay 115 billion pounds in interest on owned debt. That is more than the entire budget of the Department of Education and the Department of Defense put together. We're supposed to be a major member of NATO, and we're spending twice as much on interest payments as we are on defense. If this war in Ukraine escalates into World War III, it'll be the reverse of 1939. Poland has now got more tanks than us. They're going to have to come and rescue us in World War III. It's shame to. But that is the way we are at the moment. But I think these are the scariest numbers I want to share with you this morning. This is from the latest Civitas report. And they are saying that 54% of the British population now gets paid more in government handouts than they pay in tax. That's 36 million people are basically, to some extent, living off the state. There are 6 million people of working age choosing to stay at home and watch daytime television and not to make a contribution to the economy. At this point, I almost feel sorry for politicians. How do you make a country work with these numbers? I think that's going almost beyond the point of no return. When if, when more than half the population are sponging off the state in Washington, how can you get economic growth? How can you improve productivity? How do we get out of this hole? And look, of course, what it means is for those of us who are still daft enough to work in some kind of productive capacity, we're going to have a bigger and bigger tax burden. So now the top 10% are paying 53% of all income tax, the top 20% are paying two-thirds of all income tax. So, you know, they talk about the redistribution of tax effect. Wow. If those top 10% decided to emigrate, there'd be quite a big hole in Jeremy Hunt's next budget. And, of course, the chances are, who'd want to bet against the Labour government next year? Are they going to start reducing taxes? Are they going to look for even more new ways to tax us? Are they going to follow Joe Biden's lead with a mansion tax that's just been introduced in California? It's quite funny, all the, the uh, 
Tinseltown celebs that lined up to support his campaign in 2020 are now falling over themselves to sell their mansions before this new tax comes in. Um, what's his name? Brad Pitt just did it. He, so, he saved two and a half million in taxes. So, um, yeah, that's what we've got coming forward. And it's going to get worse. The OBR, the Office for Budget Responsibility, is saying the overall tax burden will rise by 20% faster than the growth of the economy. Now, the economy is not growing, so that's 20% faster than zero. Um, taxes will grow on income and corporation tax, as we know. If you run a business, you've just had effectively a 30% increase in your tax bill. We have a relatively small office in Richmond. Our business rates are just going up from 12,000 a year to 20,000 a year. It's a 66% increase. How is that supposed to help? You know, he talks about a growth budget. How is that going to help small business, which is an employer of 90% of the population? So it's pretty tough. So your role, our role, if we choose to accept it, is to carry the country on your shoulders, to pay ever more taxes, to support ever more people who are choosing not to work and not to contribute. Uh, anyone going to vote for that? Yeah, I don't see an awful lot of enthusiasm in the room for that. So is there an alternative? Is there another way? I think there is. What I want to talk about are the three things. An overall philosophy that we need to adopt, three specific strategies, and a couple of portfolio management tools I want to share with you. The first part's the hardest, because it means changing the way we think. Just down the road from here next month, there's going to be a coronation. You may have read a few things about it as to who's going to be there, who's not. My invite hasn't arrived yet. I don't know what's going on. Let's be lost in the postal strike. Anyway, I'd like to have a few coronations in this room this morning. I'd like to anoint each of you as the king or queen of your own personal domain. I'm personally the, the king of uh, Roania, which is a little place in the Portuguese Algarve. Um, more sunshine, less tax. Um, but it's really a kind of an independence of thinking. It's kind of a renegade approach. It's saying, look, I'm sorry, Rishi, Jeremy, Andrew, I'm not buying your system. I'm going to make my own decisions. I'm going to be independent. And if that means even to the point of going somewhere else, I'm not going to live under your rules, the mindset. What it means is becoming the sovereign steward of your family's wealth. So the sovereign part means independent, renegade, not accepting the system, doing my own thing. The steward part's equally important. I'm guessing the fact that you're in this room, you're probably the most successful person in your family. You're probably the most financially astute person in your family because you know, not everyone cho chooses to come to an event like this that they're, they're all at home watching the telly or something. So you're the ideal people to be the sovereign stewards of your family wealth. It's a responsibility as well as a privilege. We encourage our members to actually create 100-year plans, not because we expect you to slavishly stick to them, but because it elevates your thinking. You ask yourself better questions because you know, Wall Street thinks three months ahead. We've got to think three generations ahead. You know, is what I'm doing today, are the investment choices I'm making with my country of residence going to be the right thing for me, my children, and my children's children? You know, these are tough questions, but we've got to ask them. In terms of the strategy for the 2020s, <clears throat> there are three core things I want to focus on. They all begin with the word private, which makes them easier to remember. Private equity is where most of the wealth is now being created, not public stock markets. I was researching this talk and I found this amazing statistic that in America, of all the companies that are doing $100 million plus turnover, 89% of them are in private hands. There are fewer and fewer companies on the public markets compared to 10 or 20 years ago. More and more are choosing to stay private. Less regulation, less reporting restrictions, less volatility in the markets. This is where the value is happening. If you look at family offices and ultra high net worths, the biggest allocation in their portfolio is no longer real estate. It's private equity. That's where the money is if you're looking for growth. In our own portfolio, we've got companies that are already worth four times what we invested at. They're on the way to 10, 12, 14 times by the time they go public. 
This is where the big wealth creation can happen in these turbulent times. The problem with those kind of companies is they tend not to pay dividends. So you still need some income to put money on the table, which is where we look at private debt, by which we mean bonds and loan notes and things like that, which pay a decent above inflation return. See, the problem now with your classic 60-40 equity bond portfolio is you know, the FTSE is only just about reaching all-time highs from 20 years ago, and bonds are a guaranteed loss. You buy a bond at 3 or 4% when inflation's at 10%, you're locking in a loss. And if you look at why those banks failed, it's because they all bought government bonds when the uh, yields on them were very low. The, the Fed then raised the interest rates, so the new bonds pay much higher yields, so the old ones are worth much less. And once, that, once those losses reach more than the equity of the bank, they are insolvent. So, you know, you, you've got to be very careful with traditional bonds. So, so we have things that are paying 12 and 16% with quite solid security underlying them. So again, good income, a real above inflation return. And the third strategy is what I call private money, by which I mean liquid resources beyond the control of governments and central banks. You've seen what happens to pounds and dollars if you leave them in the bank. By the way, you do know it's not your money. You're a debtor, a, a, a creditor of the bank. If they go into difficulties, you might not get your money back. And they pay pathetic rates of interest. So the two obvious choices for private money are gold and Bitcoin. Bitcoin, it's, it's had a bit of a revival recently. It's back above $30,000, which for those of us who've got some Bitcoin is, is good news but it's not exactly been a, a great store of value, and it's not that easy to use as a means of exchange. There's not many coffee shops you can go into and pay with Bitcoin. Gold has got centuries of track record as a store of value, but until recently, it too was a little challenging as a means of exchange. I used to invest in gold Britannia coins, but you know, if you go into Starbucks and say, I'll have an Americano, please, have you got change of 1,647 pounds? The, uh, you know, the Gen Z, behind the uh, counter will look at the bill. <laughs> so we've now got a company that we're uh, raising capital for who fixed that problem. So now you can have gold in the Brinks vault in Zurich, you have a phone app and you have a MasterCard. And when you go into Starbucks, you tap the, uh, the terminal, it sells two pounds 50 worth of gold in 200 nanoseconds and effectively converts it to fiat. So you pay in pounds or euros or dollars, whatever. So that's a company that solved the problem of making gold a medium of exchange. Uh, so you've got private debt, private equity and private money, but you've also got to structure your portfolio. So we've got a couple of ways we help our members to do that. One is called the wealth pyramid. We've got some very nifty little make up yourself wealth pyramids on our stand if you, uh, if you want a, a little memento. So the bedrock layer is all about maintaining value, purchasing power. This is the anti-inflation layer, gold, fine art, classic cars, things like that. I put your main home in there as well. I know what Robert Kiyosaki says about it, but hey, it's a major, major part of most of our net worth. But it, none of the bedrock things provide income. So we have a passive income layer where we have buy to let property, dividend producing shares. Um, that's where we put our own bonds and loan notes. Then we have the layer that I call global diversification. This is what most investors are sadly lacking. This is about owning assets in a country other than your home country. It could be property, it could be shares, but I also include second residency and citizenship programs here. Now, I have a lot of experience of this. Back in 2018, when I thought that we were going to have a Marxist government under Jeremy Corbyn, I got property and residence in Montenegro. Turned out that'd be a false alarm. Um, so came back to Britain. And then as things got worse on the tax front, I've now moved to Portugal where uh, I pay a lot less tax than I would here. Now, we've partnered now with Henley and Partners, who are the world's leading experts on this, so our members are talking to them about what their options are. It's very bespoke. It depends on your background, your ethnicity, your family, all sorts of things. But there are lots of options to have at least some sort of plan B. Because my question is, if the solids really hit the fan here, where would you go? If, if, if things escalate in the Ukraine, where would you go? What would you do? We've got to at least ask these questions and have some kind of plan B ready if we're not going to get caught out. 
the point you end is for the fun stuff like crypto trading, um, forex trading, whatever. But please make sure you've got the other layers in place first before you do the stuff at that level. We also have a, a, a model portfolio. We're not financial advisors. We can't give you financial advice, but we can give you generic guidance. So we have a thing that we call our model portfolio. We only provide two or three of the assets in there, but you know, as you can see, it covers uh, low shares, property, commodities, etc. And we actually have a, a, a 60 minute video on this that I can give you if you want to join us. Um, so in summary, I think you need to become the sovereign steward of your family's wealth. I think you need to implement a personal gold standard by having private money outside the system that cannot be debased. You can use private equity to create medium term wealth across the rest of this decade and use private debt and dividend paying shares, buy to let property, etc., to give you income. I would personally suggest we have many members with property portfolios. Most of them now are downsizing those portfolios. We've had a 10 year vendetta against private landlords in this country. Um, if you are still a vital that landlord, you have my sympathy. Um, it's much, much harder to make money from property than it used to be. So I would say, have a look and see whether you can redeploy that capital more effectively um, in your portfolio and start thinking globally like a second residency or citizenship, so you've got somewhere else to go. So in terms of who we are and what we do, we're a community of 700 investors in 37 countries. Um, the only qualifier is the FCA requirement to be what they call high net worth, which means you either have an income of 100,000 a year or an investment portfolio of 250,000, which could be ISAs, buy to let property, etc. It's not a particularly difficult uh, challenge to meet. We don't charge any fees to be members. We don't charge investment fees. We get paid by the companies for whom we're raising the capital. So it's a free service to you. We provide a lot of content. We do uh, weekly videos. We do a quarterly newsletter. We do our own live events. And uh, uh, I also can give you that video about the portfolio. And if you do join as a result of being at the event, I can also send you a copy of my, my books called Money and Me. It's a it's kind of financial life stories of successful people. Uh, it was a, a series we did on Sky a little while ago, so happy to send you a copy of that. Um, and also, obviously, information about our portfolio. Now, this should work. If you scan that, that should take you to this domain. If not, just do it the longhand way, both at privateequity.com slash events slash London. Um, you'll also see on that page my interview with Jim Mellon, who's talking on the main stage at midday. Um, so that's all waiting for you there. So I hope that's been useful and thank you very much for listening.